It's the stuff of a Hollywood movie, but a group of veterans has filed a lawsuit against the CIA and U.S. Army claiming that the government planted remote control devices in their brains. The claims relate to a government program at the U.S. Army's Edgewood Arsenal in Maryland, where scientists tested hundreds of chemical and biological substances on at least 7,800 servicemen. So could this really be happening? Well, joining me to help discuss this is Dr. Colin Ross, president of the Colin A. Ross Institute for Psychological Trauma. Dr. Ross, tell me, is this really happening? Did the government really take part in mind control experiments on soldiers? What kind of stories have you heard from the survivors of these experiments? I know you've had access to thousands of documents from the CIA. Well, it's just like you just said, there's two kind of streams of information. There's stories from survivors, and then there's the documents. So if I go to the documents first, they're very, very detailed, 15,000 pages uh, plus. And we're starting back in 1950 with projects called Artichoke and Bluebird, which were then rolled over into MK Ultra, which in turn was rolled over to MK Search. And then all the documents stop in 1973. So in that era, 50 to 73, uh, there's a whole host of different types of mind control experiments, hypnosis, LSD, special interrogation chambers, and brain electrode implants. And so there's projects uh, in the CIA documents and in Army records where electrodes are put into uh, dolphins, and the dolphins are directed by remote transmitter to deliver a bomb to a target. And there's a discussion of uh, similar technology in cats and other animals. There's uh, research funded by the Office of Naval Research published in mainstream journals where electrodes are put in the brains of cats, dogs, and their behaviors controlled, and even human beings at uh, Harvard and Yale. So, so this is absolutely documented fact. So tell me how commonplace this was. Is this, are we talking about one program that took place decades ago? Or do you think it's happening more often than that? And if so, how could it be so secretive? I mean, most people would think this can't be true. This is, a stuff, this is stuff out of a movie. Right. Uh, it was not just one program back in the 50s, 60s, 70s. It was Harvard, uh, Yale, Tulane, UCLA. So we know there was more than one university involved more than one branch of the military, more than one program, for a fact. What's going on currently, of course, is all classified. People tell you stories about it, but I can't actually prove that it's happening today. I'm certain that it is, but I can't prove it. Okay, so did these people know what was happening to them? I mean, uh, in a lot of the articles I've read, it seemed like they kind of volunteered to be part of some sort of experiment, right? Yeah, and a lot of the different experiments, like there was a group of children in a school for the mentally retarded in New England. Their parents were told that the children were participating in a study of a dietary supplement, but actually plutonium was being added to their cereal. So there's all types of different experiments where no real consent was given. The people didn't really know what was going on, and they were basically tricked. And I think in the brain electrode experiments, it's kind of a combination of both. Some patients were told you have an electrodes put in your brain, but it's for some therapy purpose when it was really research. Others were told, go, go here and volunteer and you don't really have much choice. And others were given sort of a more exact story. So what exactly would the government do when they would control someone's mind? What could they make someone do when they manipulated their brains? Well, what it describes in the documents and in the published papers is uh, there's actually photographs of a 16-year-old girl. And she's got a series of electrodes in her brain. Depending on which button's being pushed on the transmitter, she's either strumming her guitar, pounding furiously on the wall, or staring off into space. With the animals, they're actually directed to walk or swim to a target. So you can control... Uh, the actual physical motion and the mental state. How detailed and how fine-tuned that's gotten since 1970, again, I don't know because it's all classified. And it must have gotten a lot more developed. How fast can this happen? I mean, how fast can someone's mind be taken over? Does it happen over a period of weeks or days? Well, the, the electrodes is a little different because you just put the electrode in 
you push the button and it happens right away. But with a more brainwashing style where there's sensory deprivation, sensory isolation, hypnosis, good cop, bad cop techniques, uh, we're talking months minimum. It's a long-term conditioning process. And how long can someone's mind be controlled? I've seen videos of people in these kind of hypnotic states. How long are they in those states? Well, they, they come back in experimental literature that's published in normal journals. You can have a post-hypnotic suggestion that's implanted that the person doesn't remember, and you can tap into it months at least later, if not years. In the brainwashing literature, apparently, people can be in a sleeper state indefinitely. But, of course, this is all secret and classified, so you can't actually document it and prove it. And you mentioned that you are convinced that this could still be going on today. What other kind of experiments do you think the CIA could be doing today? Well, I would say uh, intelligence agencies around the world probably have Manchurian candidate sleepers operative today. And they're using a whole range of techniques to control and create them, which is in, in terrorist organizations, there's going to be the religious doctrine part of it. But it's the basic mind control programming technology that we've known about for decades. You control a person's life space, control the information flow, uh, talk to them, talk to them, talk to them, convince them, convince them, convince them, frighten them, terrorize them, soften them up with hypnosis, drugs, which can be IV drugs or drugs by mouth. It's, so it's a whole range of different techniques. It's not just one thing. Harmful effect of nanoparticles. The emerging technology is used in a variety of medicines and even sunscreen. The research found that the small particles could damage the DNA of cells. They're tiny microscopic particles which can store and release drugs in specific areas of the body. As a result, nanoparticles are increasingly being used in medicine and surgery. But because the particles are so small, there's been growing concerns about potential toxicity. There's an emerging sort of body of evidence that says that for some particles of certain scales uh, and of certain materials, that there are potential health risks. New British research has added to that concern. It found nanoparticles could damage cells without even entering them. Scientists found the particles change the function of cells and how they communicate with other cells. What this study shows is that even with a barrier between the blood supply where the nanoparticles are and cells, um, that there can be damage to cells and not just a bit of damage, but significant uh, damage to the DNA. One of the biggest areas of concerns has been the use of nanoparticles in sunscreen. A review this year by the Therapeutic Goods Administration found sunscreen was safe and that the particles didn't penetrate skin cells. If trends in science continue, there's no doubt nanoparticles will be used more and more. We really need to do fairly sophisticated studies of the toxicity of nanoparticles before we uh, use them extensively in humans. The TGA says it will monitor scientific literature should any tangible safety concerns be identified. This is the paper in the original form. And the title is a little bit funny. It's Future Strategic Issues for Future Warfare. And they project this on the year 2025 as if they talk about future technologies. And then you have a very big, very small subtitle, The Future is Now. Now I'm a bit confused. Is it now or is it in 15, 20 years that this is going to be brought out? If you go into the entire thing, you find a number of irritating um, statements. This is kind of the second page, the little one on top. Bots, bogs and humans, welcome to the future. Bots are a short term for nanobots, nanorobots. Borgs is a term coming from s the, the uh, um, um, st Star Wars, no, not Star Wars, the Star Trek uh, s uh, filming. It's the species that is assimilating other species by turning them into half computer, half, half being. And humans, I guess they mean themselves, the one who are not affected by those games and rule the entire thing afterwards. And they, they just name a number of technologies 
that are going to be used in future wars. And they, they explicitly say the war of the future is not in between countries. They expect to have a world government. So the war happening on this planet is between the government and the normal people. And this completely different type of war will need completely different weapons. And then they list all those weapons. And um, um, there are certain things that are solved for them on nano level, on the level of nanoparticles, sensor swarms. If you have the nanoparticles in the air, it's a swarm. And it has smart dust. This is what something uh, um, we will find later in, in the details we found in the environment. Uh, nanotags, things that are placed within the human body to give them opportunity to track you down every single second and read out what you think and what you feel. And something that is not explained in this paper, they call it co-opted insects, whatever this is. I just want to point out at this moment that this is in their paper because we're going to find things that are going very much to remind us of these words. Um, other things in this paper that are worth mentioning, uh, weapons that are apparently legal. Yeah, they are talking about weapons that are hidden somewhere in the civil domain. Everybody is dealing with them, everybody is using them, and one of them is the microwave. Microwave is used for mobile phones, it's used for smart meters, it's used for uh, wireless LAN connections, and we're surrounded by um, microwaves, and they enter our body, and we think this is just a side effect of technical applications. But NASA classifies microwaves as a non-lethal weapon that is apparently legal. And... Um, they also name the uh, effect of those weapons. It's behavioral performance decrements, sizes, gross alteration in brain function, uh, 30%, 30 to 100% increase in brain flow, in, br in, in blood flow in the brain, and uh, also lethal effects that come over the time. So this is weapons brought out on mankind that NASA is opening, openly talking about, just projecting it in the paper to the future. And we are falling for this. We, we think it's something clever to have a mobile on your head half, half of the day. Um, what they also have, and uh, this is something that refers to Kara's work, is uh, explosive microdust then ca that can be intelligently moved through the air to certain points, to certain areas, you can up concentrate it and form, a, form an explosive lens, and it can can also go intentionally into human beings to kill them from inside. They say that it's it's clever enough the system to go into underground facilities with the dust, with the explosive dust, to um, to access people who are hiding down there. Um, so this is basically this NASA document that is giving a um, kind of abstract picture what could be airborne in the future, or maybe because of the future is now, could be airborne, airborne already today. Staying in hotels and found strange things happening, like forwarding active was on my phone. Um, and also, the very same day I went to get the test in 2012, um, by Columbia Investigations, I no noticed a strange sensation in my ears, and the rest of my body felt very strange, and this was the actual activation of the nanomaterials that were put in my body. And once the nanomaterials were activated, I was unable to sleep for three to four weeks. It was really, really very difficult. But we were able to find a way to get me to sleep. Then I you know, kept monitoring my progress. Um, when I went to see Dr. Hildegard Staninger, I, I had the JAM20 Pro, and I just kept looking at what my body was doing when it was activated and kept a journal, a really, really um, well-detailed journal, so I could see my results and find out what would actually work to diminish this technology. 
And at the chemical basis, Dr. Hildegard encouraged me to take herbs and a bunch of other supplements, and I mixed and matched different technologies and so forth, and uh, to the toxicological findings, and of course, it dovetailed directly into the scanning report that was done previously, and it certainly showed that my body was introduced to milita military-grade nanomaterials, or biotech. So, the summary here, I'm going to do what I can to read the conclusions on this. Of course, this is just evidence to show you that this is, in fact, a real report that uh, there's the reason and the purposes that is behind this technology was for specific reasons and soon we'll get to that. This is just you know indicating that the report that the toxicological findings reflected was indeed um, connected to the federal communications locations and then the next step was that I would go to Dr. Privatera of blessed memory. He had passed away, and he uh, recommended I get an MRI of the head with special attention to the ears because that's where I noted a lot of pain. When I would descend on the plane, I noticed that I had like pinkish ooze coming out of my ears, which was, I guess, blood mixed with something else. And so it was very, very painful, and that pain happened to me twice when I descended a plane. So needless to say, I didn't do much traveling by plane since then. Um, we have the MRI before the surgery indicating there's not a lot going on here. The whole purpose of getting the MRI was to see if it would be okay to get the polyp removed from the right sinus and to do some reconstructive surgery because I was having real difficulties breathing. And so there was nothing really noted here. Everything was A-OK -okay to go into the surgery. Then after the surgery, un, under the impressions below, it, it indicates that there was mild opacification of the mastoid air cell, which is interesting because that correlates to the Columbia Investigations report showing that there was a signal, in fact, in the same location. So this is the MRI before the surgery. There's nothing really going on in the area near the ears and then the MRI after the surgery shows the nanomaterials are present in the ears and around the ears and it, it, it webbed all the way around my head and all the way around uh, the skull and so forth so uh, very very it, it was pretty fast acting stuff here. The surgery um, after this, after this uh, MRI uh, I ended up getting tests done and of course it required that I would get like probably 150 vials of blood you know within a two two visits so probably there's about 75 vials there uh, and after that I was able to do the healing process which took five to six months so as I was doing these cleanses and healing I noticed things were coming out of my skin so I would collect the samples properly and then have them sent through chain of custody to, to, to Dr. Hildy and her labs. And the findings, this is the, the king of all tests. It's, the, it's called Raymond spectroscopy. And these are the contents collected from my scalp. And these are deadly things that are not of human origin. So, of course, you can see that it's at the millimeter scale there. They're really small. And the origin of the specimens... That's the test that was that went along with that uh, Raymond spectroscopy. Now, what Raymond spectroscopy does with FTIR and other tests like this, it will actually break down the composite materials and show what the material that was collected. What is that made out of? What's the percentage of you know what what is what are the the um, elements that were found? And of course. Uh, nanocomposite materials were in fact found. The dragon protein was found also uh, um, with, at the nanoscale in my body. This dragon protein was the, for the purposes of monitoring my genetics. The purpose in the summary, now this is important um, because different kinds of nanotech have different purposes in, the, in this particular attack. Uh, these were 
the findings of what they were looking to do. Conclusional summary. The integration of nanotechnology into the biosensory world, world to monitor or control human life is where the line in the sand is drawn for the human being. The majority of high-impact technologies that utilize brain-computer interfaces as a neuronet, neurotree network, brain chip, or biosensor would be for the following. Control and monitoring of the brain and bodily functions. Control and monitoring of the behavior of the individual, thoughts, temperature, etc. Sending and receiving verbal commands. Stimulation of bioelectrical transmissions within the neuron trees of the nerves to be utilized as a listening device for remote sensing and monitoring, to be used as a transmitter for listening in on conversations within a specific area that the individual may be in where the device has been implanted in them. If there is a digital computer component to the device, it should be used to capture visual transmissions as a walking, talking, monitoring system, a high-tech extrinsic spying system especially for military industrial espionage. So that's what the summary was. And of course, in my case, I was very puzzled as to why someone would want to bother with me. Uh, I was a nun for 14 years in the Catholic Church, and I ended up getting to know way too many things. So in 2008, I left the Roman Catholic Church. And so if you want to learn more about my story in that regard, you are welcome to go to clergyvictim.com. And there are interviews on that website where I get into my story. So they start to scratch everything open and then you can see the, the fibers and you can see little tiny hexagonal crystals coming out as well. And if, if you go into, into deeper research, you find that also they have um, intestinal parasites uh, that look like shrimps like up to five centimeter big shrimps that have these hexagons on a kind of eye that looks like an insect eye and from the insect eye these hexagons are coming off and perfect. and yeah it, it is ugly it, it, it was some it, it took some some courage to dive into this ugly research um, but it's it's a rabbit, a rabbit hole. You, you, I, I cannot other than dive deeper right. once I'm <laughs> once I'm in it. So um, the problem with this disease is if you if you bring these parasites to a biological analysis, they tell you it's it's food left over. It's plant material. It looks like meat. You know, it looks like a. a um, normal animal being or like a worm or the structure of a tissue is, is animal-like but the chemical analysis is plant-like so they send the people back home you don't have parasites everything is normal you, ha you, you ate something you didn't chew well enough so you know it survived which is from the chemical point correct okay. yeah. and if, if you put all the dots together okay and another another um, symptom with the Morgellon cases is that they have what, what they call delusional parasitosis. They have the feeling of crawling insects inside the body, on top of the body and inside the body, but the insects are invisible. So this is madness. This is labeled as delusional and they get psychopharmaceuticals to shut up their god. Yeah. So these are the three aspects of the disease. And if you go deeper into research, you find that there are um, fungi that are heavily worked on with genetic engineering that have the ability to reproduce a secondary genetic cluster and build fruiting bodies in the form of the secondary genetics. So basically they have the fungus DNA inside this is what is taking care of the growing fibers in the body. And they have like a secondary genetic cluster that is brought in with the infection. And that is making sure that the fruiting body grows in the form of the secondary genetics. And what, what the fruiting body displays actually is a, a crossbreed of spider and ant, which would not work in normal biology. But the fungus is growing this. 
And if you, if you have a secondary genetic cluster that is building a, a pseudo animal, just mushroom mimicking, you still have the cluster of the, of the genetics. And the genetic cluster is building up a bioenergetic being. And once the mushrooms go off, the bioenergetic being can detach and still live in the body of the one who is growing it. And this is the, the feeling of insects crawling. This is biotechnology on cutting edge level. Who yeah. did this? There, there, <laughs> there is one hint who is doing this. You have the same fibers as the traceable anim, uh, element in the new, brand new $20 note in the United States. If you look on the, on the dollar note with a microscope, you see blue and red fibers that are identical with this fungus. So uh, you might say at the end, you know, follow the money, the banking system is behind this. But this is bigger, you know, it's just one hint. Uh, you find the same fibers in the black magic tradition from 1500, 1600 in Europe. This is where the name comes from. If you look for the earliest name where Mogellons are first described, this is North European witchcraft. Yeah. So the, it's the first hint to trace this back to black magic traditions. But there are, there's one very strong hint. If you look at these secondary genetic beings, you find them in black magic traditions. They are all over the place. So the spiders, if you look at the Freemasonry, the god of Freemasons is a three-headed spider. Yeah. The three-headed, if you, if you look, there, there are some Morgellon victims that are clairvoyant as well, that have a sensation for what is crawling inside their body. And they made paintings. And this is the god of Freemasons. So this is from Cantrell. And this is what is, I don't know, I just know it's airborne. We have pictures of billions of these fibers in the air. You can see them at night. If you apply a, a black light, they flur give, give back a, a visible light. This is all the, the chemistry that is inside. It's always about up and down converting frequencies. Because of this, if you want to see the scientific papers, you can find scientific papers describing the hexagons and the fibers. This is pure transhumanism building an interface between radio signals and DNA-like communication. So this is a technology designed to take over the light body of the human being, which means to take over his entire spiritual experience of being a self. Yeah. This is a, what, what transhumanism is about, creating an interface between computer-generated uh, or AI-generated uh, microwave signal and DNA light communication, which is basically us. We are consciousness. We have a body, but we are consciousness. And what they try to take over with transhumanism is the consciousness by creating a technology that is able to have read-right relationship, reading out consciousness, collecting it with an antenna, and playing in consciousness. If you can read out, you can play in because you know the fine structure of the signals. You know, like a tape recorder. Getting you angry, reading out anger, sending the signal to him, making him angry. And he, if, if, as long as this is on this binary level of the plus minus electromagnetics, it can override the mind. It can never override the heart because the heart is on trinary electromagnetics. Okay. Yeah. This is different. So this, this can, can kind of completely control mind and sexuality because this is the part of the light body that is binary. This is our big chance to survive this attack and the assimilation behind this. this because if the, if the heart is ruling, yeah. you realize this is not you. You realize there's something within you, but you realize it's not you. So this is the way out.
This is the famous bear pit here in Bern, where all the tourists go, you see, it's like a castle, but this is not important. What's important is this here, an obelisk. There, this is the joining on top here, the symbol of the world domination, and uh, this is the sun hieroglyphics. The most one of the most important symbols you see it everywhere, and it's so um, it's so hidden. It's so hidden. You see it as well on American airplanes. You know, with the star in the middle and the two bars on each side. That's the sun hieroglyphics. And actually, the German army, you have the SS. If you write ISIS in Pharaonic, like in Hebrew or the Arabic, you write only the uh, consonants. So if you write ISIS, you get SS. If you take the symbol of the SS, it's skull and bones. So under the uh, symbol of total um, Pharaonic and Freemasonry symbolics, uh, the um, the SS murdered people all over Europe, and they got killed themselves. So SS skull and bones. See, SS is ISIS. So this is the most important symbols. You see it a lot in American movies as well. This one here. Then the joining, very important. The world domination. There it is. You see the two keys of the Vatican. So here are the obelisks here. Now what's an obelisk doing here? Well, it's the priest of Amun, Amun Ra. This is Egypt. And these priests of Amun, they rape our children. And the Pope is the head of a child molester circle. A pedophile organization, he's the head of it. And it's all Egypt here. This is all Egypt, even the joining that behind it. There's the joining, like in a Freemasonry temple, you see? And this is the mayor's office of Hindelbaum, yeah. And there it is, the obelisk. And the Freemasonry triangle. It says in the Bible that the, uh, the beast, the revelations of John, the beast had seven heads and ten horns. Well, let me tell you this, Switzerland has seven presidents and they divide ten ministries, ministries among each other. You see, and they financed every war. And those Swiss, you still got the Swiss guard, the Pope's guard, and the Sisters of Isis. And those Swiss, they wrote the Malias Malificarn, and they, they burned women all over Europe. And those Swiss mercenaries terrorizing the whole of Europe and the Ku Klux Klan. You know, the Ku Klux Klan is on a red underground with a white cross in it yeah so this is the center of evil switzerland and the bees had seven heads and ten horns we have seven presidents who divide ten ministries in the early days of the german nazis in the 30s and 20s a lot of freemasonry symbols are being used this is colin bones here and the fold-out pyramid templars flag as the Pope is having it. Adolf Hitler himself doing Freemasonry symbols with his hands as all politicians do now today. Secret politician Freemason symbol. The hidden hand of the Freemasons, like Napoleon, like Stalin, like the rest. Now watch his face and the sneaky gesture while he's doing it. I mean, there's no doubt. This here is a Templar's cross, and the Templars founded Switzerland. The Swiss banks and the Freemasons in 1291. See the Pharaoh show from Gure, G-I-U-R-E-H. By connecting all the angles, a perfect octagon appears. 
And this here is a Semplify Templars cross with the very same colours. The national flag of the base of the Swiss Nazi Templars. Switzerland. And when drawing a line and circling all the angles, again we'll have a perfect octagonal shape. The name octagon is a secret code word for their base Switzerland of the Nazi Templars just as hexagon used to be the key code for France. Nowadays everyone in France knows this name. And when the Swiss Nazi Templars transmit help octagon, octagon is endangered to their worldwide web of international Freemasonry, the movement of power on all key positions in the entire world will be activated to help and protect. Coming to the main reason that no government or state in the world will ever do something against Switzerland and their crimes against humanity of this highly criminal state and people without conscience. So octagon or octagon is the encoded key password for the Templars and for Switzerland. In just 10 minutes time you will know that the NATO logo holds a Templars cross the number 8 because of the 8 parts, it holds an octagon, a Swiss flag and Swiss army logo and we can all smell the swastika in it, can't we? So first of all is uh, NATO with the um, original 8 uh, octagon puzzle parts and if I turn this around here I will turn them all around. Yes, a Templar's cross with the same eight parts of the octagon parts of the NATO parts. It's very mathematical. Here's a Templar's cross from Octagon, uh, Switzerland, which was founded by the Templars in 1291. So now I'm going to show you uh, that we can make the um, swastika. I just move a couple of parts around. Well, what do you know? A real swastika. So the Nazis are within the NATO. Well, we know now that most of the Templar Nazis from World War II, as Werner von Braun and other mass murderers, well, that was the guy who made the V2 rockets, killing people in. London and Coventry. So these mass murderers and war criminals, they went to the US, Argentina, Switzerland, etc. They scattered all over the world, working for secret services and octagon blue army forces and continued to kill, murder and torture people. In South America, for the CIA, the OSS and even stayed in Germany, working for the Octagon Blue Army Police. Pope Francis Jorge Bergoglio to be removed before February 23rd, 24th. Ninth Circle Sacrificial Cult to meet in Rome that weekend. This is issued by the International Tribunal of Crimes in Church and State. A confidential source within the Vatican has alerted the ITCCS that the present Pope Jorge Bergoglio will be removed from his office by a palace coup instigated by the top leaders of the Ninth Circle, a 400-year-old child sacrificial cult within the Catholic Church. Bergoglio's removal will occur before the weekend of February 23rd, 24th, when the Ninth Circle will be holding a coven and a child sacrificial ritual at the San Lorenzo Jesuit Church in downtown Rome. 
Now traditionally, the Ninth Circle, which was established by the Jesuits in the 16th century, has played a prominent role in the choosing and induction of every new pope, and will likely have nominated Bergoglio's successor before the February ceremony. Now an indication of the imminent fall of Bergoglio is his recent failed attempt to gather support for himself among Catholic bishops all over the world. His order to all of the bishops to meet him at a special conclave in Rome in early January was ignored by over half of the bishops around the world, the boycott of him being especially prominent in America. According to the Vatican source, quote, no pontiff has ever faced such open rejection by his own clergy. Many of the bishops know his days are numbered. Now, if the damn thing would be drawn in black, like on a piece of paper, you just draw it in black like a round, forget about the red. And then if we take away two diagonals, like in white, and only the black stripes are being left, what do we get? I'm going to cut it out and show you what's left. So shown a drawn Templar's cross here, if I take away the white, it's a swastika in an original form. We just have to bend the outsides a little bit. There we get the swastika the, uh, the Nazis used. So this means the Nazis were in fact Templars. Nazi blood attained a sacred, symbolic power, ritualized and sanctified in the ceremony known as the Rite of the Blood Flag. The sort of magical power of the blood of the dead Nazis was transmitted to each Nazi flag and it was consecrated thereby. The blood flag was the crucifix of Hitler's religion. It would come to symbolize his new reign. In 1933, Hitler succeeded in becoming the Führer, the leader. With Hitler's elevation to leader, the blood religion became the undisputed religion of the Nazi party, complete with holy days and martyrs. Propaganda minister Goebbels orchestrated a ritual in which the 16 Nazi heroes were honored as martyrs of the Reich. Who died, were resurrected, then achieved eternal life. Goebbels assured that all Germans would partake in the ceremony by broadcasting it over loudspeakers placed on street corners throughout the country. Part of the message said, the night of the dead, the dead march in. At midnight, a mystical, ceremonial play, the birth of the Reich. They fight, die, and are victorious, just as the Third Reich was founded. According to Hitler, their blood was the holy water of the Third Reich.